Restoring Place Church, the church of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Dream Center, is a place where we make disciples of Christ, teach and train them to live as children of God, and to thrive in who He created them to be. We believe that this is the best time on earth to be alive, to experience the end time harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. Get ready to be renewed, recharged, and restored to go out and take the gospel to your world. Let's join our service already in progress. Well, whenever Pastor and I kind of compare notes and compare schedules and he says, can you cover this week or whatnot, I always, I always go to the Lord in prayer and say, okay, God, the Bible's full of revelation. I could read the maps and we would be blessed, right? <laughs> we could start tracking with Paul and go, wow, that's so powerful. But I really, really do pray for a word from the Lord, a now word, a prophetic word, a um, just something that's on his heart. I love to teach the word verse by verse. And if you come to King's Kitchen, when I'm teaching, we're going through the book of Galatians right now, expository. Thank you, John Jolene. I love, you know, just dissecting the word line upon line, precept upon precept. But today, um, I really, really believe this is the word of the Lord. I try to always be led of the Lord, but this was such a whoosh, like, nope, this is what you're going to speak on. And I spoke two weeks ago, and I told you I don't dream anymore. Guess what? I've had two dreams. <laughs> And they really have been very pointed, very, very powerful, very direct. And I don't believe they're just for me. I believe they're for the body here, but I believe they're for the body of Christ to whoever will have ears to hear. So, Lord, I thank you for your presence today. Holy Spirit, I just ask that every word I speak would be from the Father's heart. Help me to convey your heart. I pray every word be drenched with your presence. Lord, I just yield myself to you. So there's a book that Pastor had um, our staff read not too long ago. I believe it was last year even. It's, it's by Ed De Silvia, and it's, it's a book called The Ecclesia. I may be pronouncing that wrong. I always say it backwards. But in that book, he shared that when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, basically committed high treason, they basically took their authority, the dominion that God had given man, and handed it to the enemy. Until Jesus. When Jesus came, what did he do? When he, when he was... Uh, crucified, when he, he went into the bowels of the earth, it says, what did he do? He went and he took the keys back from the devil. Hallelujah. And now, as his body, we have been given authority. I'm going to read you just a quote so I don't misquote uh, from the book. When Adam and Eve fell, they gave over the dominion of the world to the devil until Jesus came and took back the keys. But the devil still does have power. But authority always trumps power. Hallelujah. It supersedes power. And he goes into an illustration of how a car, you have the motor. Well, that's the power. But if you don't turn the ignition and the steering, that's where the authority is. You can have power, but authority is above power. Without authority... You're trespassing. You have, no, uh, you have no right to operate in that power. And so then he goes on in the book. It says, Jesus, who is the king of kings, has invested his ecclesia with the highest level of authority imaginable. And he divined the target of his authority very precisely to us, the gates of hell. We are to push back the works of darkness. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. 
He came to reveal the Father's heart. He came to redeem men back into relationship with the Father. But one of his primary th things was to destroy the works of the enemy. I believe that there's coming an awakening on this earth to the church, but I'm going to confess. Now, I, I'm going to just back up a little bit. Everything I say today is not directed at you. It is hitting me as much as whoever will hear it. So please don't take this as a condemning word. I'm actually really encouraged by this word because I feel it's an invitation from the Lord to go deeper and to go higher. I believe it's a very powerful thing if we will step into it and take it to heart. I was so struck, it's very sobering word I'm gonna share. But I didn't come away feeling condemned. I'm like, God, I was more empowered. I was more, uh, what's the word? Just God, let's, let's do this thing, all right? So there's a coming awakening, first to the church and then on the earth, but the problem is many of the church are still asleep. If you look in the church in America as a whole, complacency has crept in where there used to be fervency. Even in my generation, uh, I got saved in the late 70s. And I remember as a young person going to prayer meetings that lasted three and four hours into the night. And it was nothing. It was like we were going to pray. And I fear now that uh, complacency... Um, Comfort has become an idol. Convenience has become an idol. We'll, we'll come and pray for a little bit, but don't, don't go overboard. You know, I've heard a, 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 a saying that, you know, on Sunday morning, you see who, how popular the pastor is, but when it's prayer, you find out how popular Jesus is. That's not to condemn anybody, but it is a truth. The prayer meetings are usually the smallest meetings in the church. I believe there's a revival of prayer that's going to take place to be able to usher in the ingathering of souls that the Lord is wanting to bring in. We're in the last days. Um, what was maybe how the enemy in the past would covertly kind of sneak sin in. Now he's just blatantly, you know, tooting a horn and waving a flag and just blatantly parading it right in our faces. And I fear that as society, as a church, I'm not talking about just this church, the church universal, we've gotten so desensitized to the blatant sin that we've got. We don't agree with it. We don't like it, but we've kind of just, well, that's where we are. And we've almost kind of given up that there would be anything different. I'm going to share with you the two dreams I had. They're very short. I'm not exalting a dream over the Word of God. I believe it was a word from the Lord, and we're going to see how it is uh, played out in the, in the Bible. The first dream was about a week and a half ago, and I was in a large gathering, much like a church meeting, and all of a sudden I found myself like being held at gunpoint. And I looked around the room. I knew some of the faces. I didn't know my assailants. There was more than one. And fear began to grip me. And I remember pleading for my life, like, oh my gosh, don't do this. Please don't shoot me. And then all of a sudden, I just calmly said, in the name of Jesus, I didn't yell, very calmly just said, in the name of Jesus, you will do no harm. You will not shoot me. You will let me go and so on and so forth. And as I said that, it was as if I had just like thrown cold water in their face and they were stunned. And I just calmly went over, took their guns, and walked out of the room. All right. I believe what the Lord was saying, we have authority. 
We have authority in the name that is above every name to stop, to thwart the plans of the enemy, to silence. It was very calm. I wasn't hyped up. It wasn't emotion. I just calmly stated what they would and would not do. Okay, second dream. I had this dream Friday night. I mean, yeah, Friday morning I woke up. Now, as I said, I had already planned my message. I was going to speak about the power of remembrance. It actually was a good message. Maybe I'll preach it one day. But in the dream, I'm with my coworker, Bonnie, and we're standing. I don't know if it was somewhere uptown Charlotte, but it was a, a, an urban setting. There were, it was a street, almost like an alleyway, and there were buildings on either side. And we were horrified. We were standing at the mouth of the street, and there was carnage everywhere. Carnage means body parts, dismembered. It looked like there had been a slaughter. There was blood everywhere, and we were horrified. We just stood there and looked. And then all of a sudden, she looked at me and she says, this is our fault. It's because the church has not prayed. And I said, oh my gosh, you're right. I said, you need to share this. And she said, no, you need to preach this. And I woke up. And I knew immediately that the Lord wanted to release this word. Pastor's been teaching about the authority of the believer. Go in my authority. Not our own. Heaven's authority. So I'm going to, for what the Lord is wanting to birth, we have got to take our place. I'm not talking about getting hyped up and hooping and hollering. I'm talking about knowing who we are. I'm going to leave Officer Kia as an example. She doesn't go, you better listen to me. Look at my gun. You know, she walks in authority because she knows the badge carries authority. She knows that the city of Charlotte is behind her. You and I must know who we are in these days. I want to look at Isaiah 60, 1 and 2. It's a, a very common scripture. Pastor always, anytime I preach, he's so encouraging. He always sends me this text with this verse. But it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. I believe that there's a timeline in Scripture. There's stuff that just has to take place for Jesus to come back. We cannot expect to create a utopia and just, you know, well, it's just going to be heaven on earth. We're to, in the midst of the darkness, release the kingdom. In the midst of gross darkness, shine brighter than we've ever shone. Because the glory of the Lord will be our covering. It'll be just like in the garden. We'll be clothed in that glory. We'll be insulated in that glory. There is a timeline, but we are people that, regardless of what's going on around us, we will walk in victory. I'm not saying our lives are going to be easy. In fact, I think they're going to get harder and harder as the day approaches. But we are going to be his burning ones. We are going to be his shining ones. A few days ago, I was standing in the hallway with some of my coworkers, Michael and Bryant, and I were talking about some of our teens that we, do, we have, and one in particular, and our hearts were kind of broken over this young man's demise and what he was going through, and I said, if he would just have an encounter with Jesus, all these issues would be resolved. And Michael said to me, we need an awakening. And when he said that, something went off in my heart. I said, yes, God, we need an awakening, a spiritual awakening. As a nation and a world were on the verge of utter collapse, 
I can't believe in the period of three years we how quickly we have progressed to where we are now it's almost like we're living in a sci-fi movie it's like how is this possible how could we go from point a to point m in three years does anybody else feel that way it's like we're on warp speed it's like we've gone from this one place and boom and i believe it's because the time is short there and there's so many things i'm not going to go down too many rabbit trails i'm going to try <laughs> but there's so many prophetic voices and just respected people in the body of christ discerning just portals of evil just being unleashed on the earth and that's where it says gross darkness will come upon the face of the people but we, his people, will be lighted with the glory of God. It's not to be frightened. This is the church's most glorious time. I turned off the news a while ago, a couple years ago, to be quite honest. I didn't know the queen had died until somebody shared it. We need to keep our eyes on what God is doing. I believe as a local church, especially here at the Dream Center, we're very good at reaching out and going out into the highways and the byways. Out of all the ministries I've been a part of, this is probably the only one that 90% of what we do is outside of these church walls. And that really is the model of the modern church. That is what we're supposed to be doing, but this is the part where I felt the Lord was, was just bringing a challenge. Um, the war that we are fighting, we can't win just by doing acts of kindness, just by loving, spreading the love of God. I believe we have to contend for the souls of men and women. I believe the Lord is inviting us to go deeper, to come up higher, to take our place and to, well, I'm going to get into it. For me personally, I felt the Lord just calling me to a greater consecration, um, to a deeper level of prayer. I love to pray. There was a season, and Kelly and I, it was back in 2017, the last week of July, we had a pastor friend say, we're going to do like a prayer and a fasting thing for a week. I thought, well, I'm not going to fast. I'll be, I'm being honest, you know, but I'll pray. Well, Kelly was self-employed at the time, and he went in the mornings and at night, and I thought, well, that's pretty radical, meeting twice a day for prayer. And we would go. And at the end of that week, we decided to continue. Now, this is nothing, oh, look at how great they are. This was a move of God. We continued this small group of about 20 of us for seven months, meeting seven days a week, twice a day. Wow is right. It wasn't natural. It was supernatural. And let me tell you, God so transformed our lives at the end of that. We were on one course, and all those desires, they weren't bad, shifted. And it was like God said, nope. And he realigned us, reassigned us, whatever. It was powerful. And in that time, we had such a grace to pray such a grace it was easy we couldn't wait to get together and you know what happened with this group of 20 people our hearts were so tightly knit together there was such a unity things began to happen prophetic utterances began to come forth the lord began to show us things and strategies how to pray and we'd pray and it would come to pass why because there was unity 
we are setting ourselves aside to pray. But again, that can't be anything done in the flesh. Anything you and I do. Now, let me back up. It's good to discipline our flesh because our flesh will never want to do what God wants. But if we're trying to do something from a religious mindset, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to pray for five hours today just to be religious or to prove to God that I love him. That's religion. That's my attempt to get in God's good favor or to prove something to him. It has to be a motivation of the spirit and then we walk in obedience to it. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Luke 18, verse 1, says, Men ought always to pray and faint not. There's a thing that we used to call in, in the old times or whatever, prevailing prayer. Have you ever heard of that? Prevailing. Prevailing means you don't just say a prayer and go, okay, it's done. Now, I believe you can believe in faith it's done. But then there's a place of prayer we step into that's prevailing prayer. You prevail. You tarry. You wait. Have you ever heard, I'm going to pray through? That used to be a term when I got saved. It's like you didn't, you came to the altar and it was like, God, I got to do business with you. But sometimes a one sentence prayer didn't do it. You had to, you had to pray through. I know in my own life, my son, there was a time he was going through a terrible time. And one night we both woke up and he was on our hearts. I think it was like two or three in the morning. We got up. And I began to pray for him, but it wasn't like God touched my son. I began to weep, and it wasn't out of panic. It wasn't out of, oh, I'm so sad. It was a travailing. It was a prevailing prayer. God, my son needs you. Lord, step in in put people in his path he needs a breakthrough prevailing prayer is so much different than we're gonna just pray and those prayers are fine but God is calling us to what he is wanting to unleash on this earth we have to step back into that place of the travail for those of you that have had babies there's a period of transition where it's like oh my gosh Right at the very end, before that baby is brought forth, it is work. That's prevailing prayer. That's getting a hold of God's heart, allowing him to put his burden. Remember that? The burden of the Lord. We don't hear that anymore. The burden for souls. The burden for souls where we look at people and we see them the way God is or God does. Where we look at people and go, my gosh, if somebody doesn't rescue them, they're going to hell. We as a church have to get back into that place where we ask the Lord for his heart. God, give me, break my heart with what breaks your heart. That's where we become the ecclesia. And we have all authority, but we have to first have his heart. It's not to pray or to, uh, to release our agendas. It's to release his agenda, his heart, his kingdom. You go on to read the rest of that little excerpt in Luke 18, and it's talking about the unjust judge and the woman that just kept annoyingly, you know, and it says for her importunity, her consistent knocking, he finally said, oh my gosh, let me just deal with this woman. That's prevailing prayer. I remember when, this was before I got saved, and my stepmother had my dad and stepmother had gotten saved and she tells me that she would just get in her car to go to work and she'd begin to pray for me and all she would do is weep. That's prevailing prayer. That's travailing for the souls of men. That's allowing God, you know, sometimes prayer doesn't have to be English. It can be tears. It can be groanings. It says the Spirit will give you utterance. She would just pray in the Spirit and weep and weep. (sighs) 
When you and I were born again, we were called to be sons and daughters, but we were also enlisted to be priests, priests and kings. Now, in the Old Testament, you had to be part of the lineage of the priest to be able to minister to God. But in the New Testament, it's changed. And one of the things that the priest did was he was to offer prayers before the Father. He was to offer prayers in the temple. But you and I are now that temple. Amen. We are to be called houses of prayer. Yeah. You know, Jesus, when he went into the, to the um, synagogue and they were, you know, he said, you've made my house a den of thieves, but you shall be called a house of prayer. That's you and I. His body should be a house of prayer. I want to look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. And I know these are common. We, 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 we quote them, but please hear them with fresh ears. It says, if my people, how about if my ecclesia, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Hallelujah. I'm just going to read a couple of verses back to back. Ezekiel 22. Now, I'm going to give you the background on this. This picture paints a picture of the corruption that was in the priesthood. They were robbing, they were stealing, they were lying, they were sleeping around the priests. I wonder if the church universal is in that state. Only God knows. But I believe we've fallen from a standard of holiness that we once held dear. The chapter paints a picture of the corruption in the priesthood in those that were supposed to be upholding the righteous standards before the people. And this is what God says at the end of it. He's, he's just lamenting over the state of his priesthood. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I would not destroy it but I found none. So number one, he's saying, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. Number one, for the state of the church, let's say, and then to stand in the gap for the land. What does it mean to stand in the gap? Here's somebody in need. Here's God. You stand in the gap. You bridge the gap. You begin to take on their burden. Go to God on their behalf until you see the breakthrough. That's prevailing prayer. That's agonizing in prayer. Even Paul, the apostle, says, I travail over you until Christ be formed in you. It's like, oh, that you would just walk in the fullness of who you're to be. Prevailing prayer. And then the last scripture is Joel 2.15. Now some of these scriptures, they pertain particularly to Israel, but there is a spiritual connotation and a spiritual interpretation. So although they were directed to Israel after being in, held in captivity, I want you to look at it from a spiritual perspective, what the Lord is saying to us. He's saying, blow the trumpet in Zion. Anytime they were called to arms or called to war, they would get a shofar and blow it. It was like a proclamation, like, wake up, wake up. It's a call to arms. And he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, and gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Basically, he's saying, look, put aside all the pleasures of life. Put aside your schedules. Put aside 
your convenience and your comfort. Let, and let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them weep between the porch and the altar and say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? I forget the statistic, but I read something recently where it was talking about one generation to another and stating, if a generation does not experience a move of God in their lifetime, we're only one generation away from apostasy. Our generation right now, this current generation of young people, if they don't have a true encounter with God, we're in trouble. That's a very sobering thing. We, the people of God, his kingdom of priests. How many priests? If you're born again, you're a priest. We, his people, must answer the call to stand for the church that's still asleep, number one. And then this generation of youth that has never experienced a move of God. Will we stand between the porch and the altar? That speaks to me of standing before the Lord. We're in church. We're in the glory. We're, oh, this is great. But then we're not afraid to go to the porch and outward will we stand in the gap will we weep for those that have not experienced the goodness of god in my conversation with michael oh let me back up i think what happens this happens to me maybe it, it bears witness with you you look at all the state of the earth you look at the even charlotte the, the brief time that I've lived here, it seems like it's more and more liberal. It's more and more sinful. It's more and more, it's just more. And it gets discouraging. And you think, God, what can be done? Look at Nineveh. Look at Nineveh. Jonah prayed. He preached the message of repentance. And in a day, a whole nation turned. But we look at that and go, well, that's impossible. That could never happen here. I'm going to read you something that's going to get you stirred up. Build your faith to believe in that. So in my conversation with Michael earlier, when he said, you know, we need a spiritual awakening, he recently learned about the Moravians. Anybody know about the Moravians? They had a prayer movement, again, God birthed, where they came together 24-7, now this, this will blow your mind, for a hundred years. Oh, wow. They had such a heritage of being prayers and priests before the Lord. But out of that place, they went past just the altar. They went to the porch. They, they interceded and they sent out missionaries. And this is how they did it. They got in boats. I've read accounts of missionaries being sent out from their little camp in Moravia, Germany, I believe it is. There was one man in particular, he was engaged to be married, but he felt the call to be a missionary. I'm trying to get my facts straight. wasn't planning on sharing this, so I want to tell it accurately. They got in the boat, and how they decided where they were going to evangelize was they put up their sail, and they just let the Lord take them wherever they went. And they basically waved to their loved ones on the, on the pier, knowing that they would never see them again. This one account of two such, it was two, I don't know if they were brothers or just friends, they landed on an island and they were uh, um, a company of slaves. 
And they had such a burden to minister to those that were held as, as slaves. They said, how can we possibly get into the camps and be able to, to minister to them? And they decided to sell themselves into slavery so that they could be in the camp and minister. That's like unheard of. That's how radical they were. Revival or awakening, we coined that phrase and we think, oh, that's a powerful meeting. I'm going to read you something. from a transcript of a man by the name of Duncan Campbell. He was part of a move of God in the Hebrides. I challenge you to look him up, to look up the history of the Hebrides revival because it will, it will rock you to your core. Kelly and I heard a transcript, uh, an audio um, of him as an old man retelling, and we just wept and wept and wept. But let me read a part of it. He went to the Hebrides. It's over in the Isle of Lewis, off in the, somewhere in Ireland, all in that little, you know, all those little islands. And he was invited to come preach. And what had happened was the pastor of the parish, he felt like, you know, we need to really start to take to prayer and find out why the church is in such decline. And there was a small number of people that banded together and began to pray. But in particular, two sisters, one was 82 and one was 84. And the one that was 84 was blind. And they began to pray. They prayed day and night and just began to prevail in prayer and they got a visitation from the Lord they got a vision from the Lord and they went to the pastor and they said pastor we have seen a coming revival of young people now at the time their church had <laughs> this many young people it was old you know white-haired grannies and whatever and the church was basically dead but they continued to pray and cry out for what they have seen. That's the part of getting into that place of prayer and seeing in the spirit what God is wanting to birth and then partnering with him. Amen. All right, Amen. let me read this to you. This is an excerpt of what he said. And this is Duncan Campbell. And he said, first, let me tell you what I mean by revival. An evangelistic campaign or special meeting is not revival. In a successful evangelistic campaign or, campaign or crusade, there will be hundreds, even thousands of people making decisions for Christ. But the community remains the same. And the churches continue much the same as before the outreach. In revival, God moves into the district. Suddenly, the community becomes God-conscious. The Spirit of God grips men and women in such a way that even work is given up as people give themselves to waiting upon God. In the midst of the Lewis Awakening, the parish ministers at Barvis wrote, The Spirit of God was resting wonderfully on the different townships of the region. His presence was in the homes of the people, on meadow and moorland, and even the public roads. This presence of God is the supreme characteristic of a God-sent revival. Can a nation be changed in a day? Can Charlotte be one in a day? Yes. Amen. Amen. With a God-sent revival. Where it's not people being conscious of, oh, we're going to preach the gospel, and yeah, people are going to respond. That is wonderful. But what I'm talking about is getting into that place where we begin to usher in the harvest of souls. Um, then he goes on, and he, and he talks about, I'm just going to share one little snippet of a meeting. It had started about 9 o'clock at night, and it said, it was a remarkable meeting. God sovereignly moved, and there was an awareness of God, which was wonderful. The meeting lasted until 4 o'clock in the morning. 
We get upset if it goes to 12.30. And I had not witnessed anything compared to it. Around midnight, a group of young people left a dance hall and crowded into the church. There were people who couldn't go to sleep because they were so gripped by God. When we heard the the story of this and the the retelling by Duncan Campbell, he said people would run to the church. There was no room to get into the church. They were so overcome with the tangible conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were just waiting. And this is where he said, after the meeting, there was no appeal made whatsoever. After the meeting, for over three hours, I pronounced the benediction. He kept telling people, you can go home, and told the people to go out, but mentioned that anyone who wanted to continue could come back later. About that time, the clerk of the session asked me to come to the back door. There was a crowd of at least 600 people that had gathered. Again, he pronounced the benediction, and it just continued and continued. This is just a small snippet of what God did in that, in that island. But it says, it takes the supernatural to break the bonds of the natural. Amen. You can make a community mission conscious. You can make a community crusade conscious. But only God can make a community God conscious. Just think about what would happen if God came to any community in power. Think about that. If God would visit the city of Charlotte in the magnitude of what I've just shared, our city would be transformed. And the great thing about this is it wasn't contained in one little aisle, one little region. It spread like wildfire. I've talked about, you know, seeing things in the sphere of fire. You just, you start it, and wildfire is uncontrollable. It spreads. It just takes the fire of the Holy Ghost to get it going, and then the wind of the Spirit to carry it. Revival or awakening is not just a week-long series of good meetings. True revival or awakening will totally ruin you for mediocre Christianity. But if we've never encountered the more, we'll settle. We'll think this is all there is. This is good enough. I'm saved. Don't you want to see God move like in the days of old? I remember when Kelly and I, we moved, when we first moved to the States, we were in a church in Florida, and we had some friends that told us about the Brownsville Revival. It was in a little church in Pensacola, Florida. It was in the, the 90s, the later 90s. And the thing about this revival was it was a revival of repentance. It was such an outpouring in that little city that people from all over the world were coming. So we decided to make a road trip, and we went. We had to wait eight hours in line because there were people from nations. There were people from Germany. There were people from all parts of the U.S. so hungry to come in contact with a true, authentic move of God. We finally got into the building, and we ended up on the last row of the balcony. We've never seen anything like it. When the evangelist began to preach and gave the call, he hadn't even given an altar call. Again, you had to see it to believe it. People were running to the altar. They were weeping. And the outcome of that revival was holiness. It wasn't legalism. It wasn't, oh, you got to get your act together. It was such a holy move of the Spirit of God that people were on fire. And they took that fire back with them to their churches. 
and it began to spread. But how did that start? I shared just a little bit of the Hebrides revival. Those two little spinster ladies in their elder years prayed a move of God in. Research the Brownsville revival. You'll hear about the pastor, the senior pastor, Pastor Kilpatrick. He had a thriving church, or what he, on the outward. You know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is addressing the churches. And there's one church, he says, you think you're all this and that you're alive. But you know what he said? He said, you're dead. I'm not talking about being overly, you know, inward and, oh, God, am I okay? Am I doing right? And being self-examining all the time. But sometimes we need to be brave enough to say, God, where am I? Am I where I need to be? He said, go back and do the former things so that you return to your first love. I remember when I first got saved, man, I was a Jesus freak. I got stuff written on my locker at school, Jesus freak, you know. I was so in love with him. I did whatever I could to be with him, to be at his feet, to worship, to pray. And through the years, I got educated, and I got to be a good Christian and kind of lost some of that zeal. He's saying, come back to that place. But this pastor, how this move of God was birthed, from the outward, it looked like a, you know, it was just a basic, I guess it was a Pentecostal church or church of God, I'm not even sure, or assemblies. They had a big, you know, membership. But he he tells the story, I've heard him on many, many different interviews, where he would just, Saturday night, lights off, he's the only one in the church building. He's just walking. He's crying out at the top of his lungs, God, we've got to have you. Now, he was born again, but he knew there was more. He knew there was something God wanted to birth in his city, in and through that place. He wasn't satisfied with mediocre Christianity. He wanted to encounter the fire of God. He began to cry out. I don't, I don't remember how many months or whatever. It wasn't a quick answer. Because what is God calling us into? That place of prevailing prayer. We're so, so conditioned to instant Christianity. Oh, microwave. Oh, you go through the drive through Oh, they're taking too long. I'm going somewhere else. Instant. Instant. God says, won't you tarry with me? Won't you wait in my presence? Won't you wait till you hear from heaven? Remember I talked about the shakers a couple of weeks ago. They would just sit in silence. They didn't have a wonderful worship team to take us into the heavenlies. They just sat and they refused to move until they felt the stirring of the spirit. So the Brownsville Revival, he cried out and cried out until one Father's Day, boom. And there's a story, you can look it up. The evangelist was speaking and the pulpit split in two. That would get your attention. That was a supernatural move of God that went on in I don't know how many years, but it went on several years. And countless millions got saved, got baptized, ran to the altars in repentance, got their lives straightened out. That's how we ended up in North Carolina. God spoke to Kelly in one of the services, and he says, will you go where I tell you to go? Will you ride with me? And three months later, we resigned from the church staff we were a part of, put our house on the market, and we came to North Carolina. 
And the week before we were ready to leave, Kelly was doing a big painting job. I had come up with the kids early. He was on the top of a ladder painting. And he heard the Lord say, you're going to see revival come down like rain. You're going to see people healed, delivered, saved. We haven't seen it yet, but it's coming. We're in a spiritual battle. We've already won the victory, right? We're already positioned from a place of victory because we are in him. Where are we seated? We're seated in heavenly places, but we must take our, our place on the wall, and we have to take our authority over the works of the enemy. When you're in a war, what do you need? You need to take up your weapons, right? You need to take up everything that God's given us. Our weapons aren't carnal, but they're mighty through God. Mighty. A couple of Wednesdays ago, we were in prayer, and I was just praying for the harvest. You know, that scripture, especially the Passion Translation, it says the harvest is heavy and ripe. It's plenteous. But there's not enough people to bring it in. And Pastor has shared before his farming background. If you don't bring in the harvest at the right time, it's going to rot on the vine. There are people waiting for you and I. But this is what I saw. In the spirit, I saw wheat about this high. And wheat speaks of souls. And I saw a sickle. I had a sickle in my hand, and all of us were just going as we walked. We were reaping the harvest, reaping the souls. It says the harvest is white, but you have to have eyes to see it. How many times we get so in our own little world, you're walking past people. I don't have time. My husband's a talker, and sometimes I get irritated. We'll go to Home Depot, and he's in a 30-minute conversation. But a lot of times, it's the Lord, and he begins to minister. I'm like, come on, let's get, let's get what we need and go. We need to be sensitive of the harvest around us, and we need to pick up our sickles. God is sovereign. He doesn't need you and I, but he chooses to partner with us. God is looking for a people who will take their place on the wall, lay down their lives in prayer, and fight for the souls of men and women, and bind the spirit of lawlessness that's in our land. Like that dream I had, Bonnie was like, this is our fault. This carnage, this, this massacre that the enemy has brought is because the church has been too lazy to stand in the gap. Been too lazy to really pers- persevere in prayer. This word is not meant to be condemning. This is an invitation I believe the Lord is just saying, look, there's so much available. There's so much I want to do. If you would just be who you're meant to be and stand between the porch and the altar and stand in the gap and prevail for the harvest, prevail for our neighborhoods, prevail for our city to turn just like Nineveh did. He is looking to his ecclesia. to be who she's meant to be. And it's only a work of the Spirit. This isn't meant to, oh, you need to come to prayer. No, that's not what it's about. It's for you and I to examine ourselves and say, God, am I burning hot for you? Have I lost my zeal? Have I lost my passion for your presence? Have I lost my hunger for your word? Do I even care about the harvest? I'm going to be honest. Years and years ago, I was like, yeah, okay, 
I'm not an evangelist. I don't really care about soul winning. It's because I didn't have the Father's heart. I didn't realize who I was. I didn't realize the role I play in history. Each one of us alive on the earth today is because we were here for such a time as this. Amen. It's not coincidence. So what I want to do before we pray for people at the end, I want to just challenge you. I don't want a response from you. I believe we're coming into the days of the church like Ananias and Sapphira. If you make a vow to God, if you make a commitment, don't do it to please man. You better be right. You better be sincere because I believe the spirit of the fear of the Lord is coming back to the church. He's going to move in such power, but there's also going to be an awe that's going to come back to the church. You remember those days where you're like, oh my gosh. Like if there was a prophet in the church, you didn't even want to lock eyes with him because he, oh. <laughs> you remember those days? I do too. And it was like, God, I better be straight. Because back then, they, they'd call you out. We need to live holy lives. We need to be his burning ones. What I want you to do is close your eyes. If you have felt the Lord challenging you to answer the call, to step into that place on the wall. And you're saying, God, I repent of my complacency. I repent of wanting to be in a place of comfort and convenience. But you want to take your place and to help stand in the gap and to be that vessel where God can pour through you to prevail and to avail and to weep and to cry for the souls of men. I just invite you to stand before God. You're not standing before me. You're saying, God, afresh, I just consecrate myself. And so, Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I pray that you would stir us to wake us, God. Stir us to wake us, that we take our place as your ecclesia, that we would push back the spirit of lawlessness in our land, and we'd loose your kingdom. And God, most of all, I pray for your heart, your heart for the lost, the heart, your heart for the broken, your heart for the 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 person that's downtrodden, God, that we would pay the price. And just like in the Hebrides and the Brownsville revivals, Lord, that we would pay the price in prayer and usher in this last move of God that you're wanting to birth in the earth. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to do a, a work in our hearts. It's nothing we can manufacture. But God, we say we are willing and we yield to you. So Lord, I thank you for each one in the room today. I thank you, you know them by name. You know them by heart. You have engraved them on the palm of your hand. And God, I pray that you'd meet every need you draw them in closer. Lord, give them a discerning ear that they hear you more clearly. Give them a heart that thirsts and hungers for you. I thank you, Lord, for the invitation to partner with you. And we just say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to just make a um, special prayer available. If you have a need, we are a believing church. We believe in 
healing. We believe that God does answer prayer. We will partner with you. But if I could have some of the staff come up and just uh, be available to pray for people. And uh, we will see you next week. Pastor Noble will be back next week. And um, have an awesome week. Amen. Thank you again for being our guest here on The Voice of Healing. When you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, join us for our 10 a.m. Sunday morning service. Our website, restoringplace.org, has all the details on how to find us. While you're on our site, check out ways you can volunteer at the Dream Center. Need someone to answer questions about us or to pray with you 24-7? Call our prayer line at 704 904 9025